Hey, good morning, good afternoon or good evening, depending on when you're watching this edition of Hypnosis Week Live. Yes, it's me again, Alex Williams Smith by birth, but better known to many of you as Jonathan Royal, the British bad boy of hypnosis of MagicalGuru.com. And I've got another amazing guest for you. Yes, I have indeed. Now, I know you might be eager to go and look at the website link below the video, but you can do that after we've spoken to the lady who's waiting to join us. Uh, but those links will take you to her website where her books are and information on everything else that she does. Uh, you can see her sat there patiently. She's I'm here in England and she's over there in California, I believe. Yes. Yes, California, Excellent. Los Angeles area. The lady I'm about to introduce you to is a psychologist, a psychotherapist, a counsellor, a marriage, family and child therapist, a certified medical hypnotherapist. All of them are no doubt, well, they all come together as that's what the next hour is going to be about. So mm. please welcome to the show, Dr. Carol Francis. Well, since you have so many names, what do I call you? I have no idea. Do I call you Jonathan Royal, bad boy? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think you keep it easy, Jonathan. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was nice to meet you, Jonathan. And, I, you know, hello to everybody that's going to be listening now and in the future. I am so, so looking forward to this dialogue. Uh, and it can go in some Start at the beginning. Okay. Which is uh, the, this question I ask everyone every week. The, right. the, the first question and the last ones are always the same. What happens in the middle is we'll see. All right. So the first question is, there was a time when you weren't all those things. You weren't a psychologist, psychotherapist, counsellor, <laughs> therapist for marriage, family, child. You were none of them. But something led you into this industry. Tell us a little bit about your story, your path to being where you are today. You know, there's so many ways I could take this conversation, but I'm going to, I'm going to do the straight line approach. And that is this, I was raised in a family of scientists and musicians. So okay. I was constantly in the throes of two sides of the brain or two sides of the process, the artistic, the philosophical, the spiritually oriented, the reverential part of life, as well as I was exposed to science, hardcore objectification, empiricism, and the delight of that, the pure, wonderful delight of that. And the synergism of just living in that kind of existence never felt like there was a clash. And in fact, it just made me feel very curious about human beings on all sorts of different levels. And, and then human beings became kind of a, 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 a real interest of mine. I thought at one time I'd be an archaeologist and go dig up all the historical, you know, I don't think that would have suited me. Being in the dirt would have been fun. But I think it would have been too boring otherwise. But, you know, I was so interested about human nature and what we are like and what we are all about. And then I began to work a lot with people. Uh, just they call me up in the middle of the night and say, hey, I've got this situation. And I was always a listening ear. And I began to realize that people live chronically kind of disempowered in their lives, me included, all of us included. And now with COVID-19 going on, we are really facing a level of disempowerment. Mm -hmm. And how do we navigate with the, uh, with the elements of power that we do have? And so I really think that this unfolded into, okay, so if I become a clinician and being able to help people become empowered in their life, that probably is going to be not only really interesting from a scientific point of view, but also in terms of the philosophical and, and real care about human beings. And I just have been able to take this pursuit in all sorts of different directions. From So I'm very much into brain research. I have brain research projects that are going on. They're all about the, the brain waves and the EEGs and the study of the way we actually shift our brain in terms of its neurology, its biochemistry. But I'm also all about the spiritual and the, and the, and the religious and the philosophical aspect of us. And, and everything in between, it just feels like it's just all part of this one grand collection and I've never really felt like they were at odds until, until I began to hear people argue as if you had to be in one camp or the other. And I kind of went, hmm, which camp am I going to choose? And I decided, Jonathan, I'm not going to choose either camp at all because actually it's all part of the same cosmos. That's a really long answer. What do you think? Where do we go from there? No, that wasn't a long answer. Oh. That was very concise, actually. Um, I, I'll tell you where we go from there. I mean, you sort of said you ended up deciding that you're not choosing one camp or the other. And that kind of answers the next question, but there's still a little bit unanswered, which is, okay. 
you do you 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 do the whole counseling psychotherapy psychologist family marriage child therapist bit yep. which is i'm going to say the the conventional perceived respectable <laughs> genuine root so yes, to speak absolutely and then you also do do hypnotherapy mm-hmm. now now notice how I you put those in two different camps yeah because generally <laughs> speaking mm-hmm. in my experience what most psychologists psychotherapists counselors um Obviously, I'm I'm just using those. I'm not saying marriage, family, and child therapist because that's more of a long-term thing. But psychologists, psychotherapists, counsellors, the things they deal with, generally speaking, it takes a long number of sessions to achieve what with hypnotherapy can be achieved in one, two, maybe three tops. Mm -hmm. And that's where I see a potential conflict. Because over here you do all this work, but over here there's a lot of things that conventionally are dealt with by psychologists, psychotherapists, counsellors that hypnotherapy can deal with quicker. How, how do you find the balance between the two? Well, you know, this is a this is an interesting question I just actually had at the last International Hypnosis Federation conference, which I often speak at at, a, at an annual basis. Yeah. And um, I, I so I'm going to pull out one of my books here. Oh, gee, where do I go? <laughs> On the bottom here, this is a book I wrote: Paths to Recovery After Abuse and Trauma. Do I have that center framed there? Yeah, so you do an, indeed. Yeah, I have an entire program that's on a, it's called abusetraumarecovery.com. And we're trying to make it free during this COVID-19 era. I have to get my web designer to get that shift. If you need free access to it, just contact me. Um, but it is all about people dealing with some really gnarly sorts of things, Jonathan, the sorts of things that clinical psychologists are really keyed at working at because this is, um, you know, people, we're living in a type of trauma society right now. We're traumatized by the thought that we could die by COVID-19 or someone that we love could be very ill or die by it as well. Yeah. This is a kind of, this is a kind of um, insidious trauma of possibilities. We live with the possibility. If you live with the possibility of living on the streets because you're going to lose all money. You live with the possibility of divorce. You live with the possibility of a child uh, dying because of an accident or something. Living with that possibility is as much trauma as actually having to go through the possibility because you're left with your imagination. I realize this is a long, circuitous way around to get to your question. So, no, no, this is brilliant. Please carry on, Carol. Yeah. So we okay. So then I'll just call, go along this path. So, so we we're living in in the in the trauma created by our anticipation because our anticipation is left up to our imagination, and our imagination is fueled by facts, interpretation of facts, wondering what facts are being omitted. So now we get into our own awareness that we are being lied to. We never know when. So then we go into our own like conspiracy theory sort of trauma. And then we live with our own sense of vulnerability and helplessness. And and there's this path that I just created. It's even longer than that. But all of that is left into our imagination. It's left to ourselves. And this is where the insertion of hypnosis and understanding hypnosis on so many different levels is incredibly crucial is is to to, because this is where we can really apply the power of our mind and the power of hypnotic suggestion because all of that imagination whether it's based on fact science knowledge personal narrative experiences you're having or imagination all of that is something that we give to the the movie screen of our brain, and it affects everything inside of our body. That's all hypnosis. It's hypnosis by reference. It's hypnosis. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to go off on one sentence because this will govern our entire conversation, Jonathan. You ready? Um, Oh, I'm being visited by cats here in my my house. (laughs) So one person, uh, uh, Dr. Shelley Stockwell, who's part of the IHF Federation, Uh, is one of my many hypnosis uh, mentors throughout my life. I've been doing this for 42 years, long life. So, you know, so 
she she said one thing, Carol, if you do, if you do not remember anything else I've ever said to you, remember this one thing. And I want everybody to remember this. Everything is hypnosis. Bottom line, we can end our discussion. Because once you begin to really think about the profoundness of those three words, everything is hypnosis, you begin to realize that you're constantly under the influence of yourself and others. And therefore, the more you take your own self-influence to your betterment, chances are you're going to optimize what you can optimize. You can't optimize everything. There is an element of we are helpless on some things. We live in a collective consciousness, yeah. a collective experience. But in the process of being a member of that collective consciousness and that collective experience, we also have tremendous impact on what we contribute and create in our space. And so if you say to yourself, everything is hypnosis, everything that the collective brings to me, everything I bring to the collective, everything I bring to myself has an element of this hypnotic influence on my body. Because in a sense, my body is waiting for my instructions. And so it's either waiting for my instructions unconsciously, consciously, or subconsciously. And so as it's waiting for my instructions, whether I allow that instruction to come from some source and I allow myself a physiological response, and notice I keep using the word allow, because mm -hmm. that word allow is like an empowering phrase. We don't always know that we can allow or disallow those types of influences because we don't live as in the power of being able to say, I will now allow this or I won't allow this. And again, so many things are happening. Like how many, how many pieces of stimuli in this very moment are you absorbing? Like 10 million bits of data your brain is processing in this second and in this next second. And so to process that much, clearly we're not in charge of everything that our brain is trying to process. But to the degree that we can be in charge of a portion of that and actively influence we are uh, exercising that influence on ourselves. We're exercising our own impact on ourselves. So now, having said that, we can go back to your original question, but we can also go a million different directions as well. So if I go back to your original question for a yeah. moment, I think that you creating a dichotomy between long-term and short-term is dangerous. There you go. I think creating a dichotomy between what's hypnosis and what is not hypnosis is inaccurate because everything, whether or not it takes a long time or a short time, is under the impact of hypnosis. And everything that can be done quickly like that is hypnotherapeutic. And everything that takes time is also an element of hypnosis as well. So I do know that when, uh, for example, my mentor, Sigmund Freud... No, I'm not that old, <laughs> but not, not too much younger. Uh, Sigmund Freud, he would use hypnosis when he t finally understood more and more and more of it. And no, the Netflix version of Freud is not accurate, but it's very fun. So <laughs> the, the, the whole idea of being able to use hypnosis to help people explore, go deeply, imagine, create, Dis uncreate because if they've had some connection as well as a suggestion he used it both in terms of the long-term influence that it would have on someone working through trauma and the impact of that and the short-term capacity to stop some sort of hysterical responses that he would see people engaged in in a matter of seconds so he was actually a scientist that looked at both the way in which hypnosis was relevant to all sorts of different time frames of development. Now, and in, in many of the circles of hypnosis, including the ones that I come from, hypnosis is seen as a tool of short-term interventions because it's powerfully able to affect that. Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately for me, I receive a lot of those clients from hypnotherapists or from clients who went to hypnotherapists where the short-term approach did not work. And those clients are left with the feeling of there must be something wrong with me that I couldn't make hypnosis work for me. So now they have what's called the client shame. You know, I want my, my therapist to be right. So I'll take the blame that the technique didn't work. And yeah. that's a really dangerous and not a good place to leave human beings. 
So the idea of being able to say, maybe that technique didn't work for you. Maybe there's other processes that go on. We are wonderfully human, you know, diverse human beings. Even the way COVID-19 is impacting people. Some people have very few symptoms, but nonetheless, they're active. Some people have no symptoms. Nonetheless, they're in the midst of it. Some people are dying and they can't even catch their next breath because the, the very cellulite of their, of their lungs are being eaten up or destroyed. I mean, these are extreme responses that are, you know, that are, that cover all sorts of different gamuts. And all that illustrates is that we're all very different. We're all very unique. And therefore, even the ability to change what's going on with you needs to be respected because what might help you change in this moment may be different than what helps you change on that other issue in the next moment. And so I really believe whether you're a hypnotherapist or any sort of healthcare professional that's in the mental health process, that's using the psyche and the body and everything that we are in our minds, the more tools we have, whether they're short-term and quick and solid and powerful, or take different amounts of times or different types of approaches, the more we have, the more diversity we have, the more we can take our clients on a path that will be authentically transformative to them without leaving them in the shame that that one type of technique did not work for them. Wow. Jonathan, that's my answer. What do you think? <laughs> Excellent. I do have to, I do have to, I'll pick up on one teeny part of that. You mentioned sick mind fraud, as I call him. He <laughs> of kill your father, um, you know, kill your father, fuck your mother fame. Um, and. Um, well, that's not actually his fame, but that's definitely the distortion. <laughs> well, yeah, it's certainly, it's certainly the way that he, he's generally referred to. Um, now, whether what's right, what's wrong, that that part's semi irrelevant. However, one of his key things was uh, analysis. Yeah. To find the root cause of the problem, to cause the ab reaction, the release catharsis moment, to release the underlying triggers, so that then the symptoms would disappear, and there'd be no chance of any symptom substitution or anything because the triggers the underlying stuff had totally been gone so playing devil's advocate because i came to that question from the angle of oh, long term versus short term mm -hmm. what would you say to the people out there and they're probably in the minority actually because most hypnotherapists these days do tend to go why should you drag things out but there is that argument, isn't there, that, yeah, you might get the smoker come to you and you stop him smoking in one session and he never smokes another cigarette again. But in, like, whether it takes two weeks or two months, it could manifest itself in some other form uh, as a different habit because what the actual triggers were for the smoking weren't uncovered, weren't released, weren't removed, so-called mm. symptom substitution. So there's also the argument that perhaps things should be taken, should be taken a bit longer over than the rapid approaches that some people are doing these days. What's your thoughts on that? I, well, I, I think, again, you're just beautifully illustrating that every situation probably deserves its own particular uh, intervention. And we're not always going to be able to match our intervention tool to what the, was going on for them. So, for example, someone comes to me to do a stop smoking. I have my protocol. I take people through. It's been very successful. At the same time, I find that when I'm working with those people, that within my protocol, there's enough room to be able to look at the more long-term issues that you're referencing if necessary, if indicated. But if it's not, I mean, how much better to be able to just go in, go out, be done with smoking and get on with life and maybe deal with the other issues without having to worry about making your body more compromised, immune deficient. I mean, one of the leading complications they're finding uh, for COVID taking effect in people's lives are two things, smoking and obesity. You know, these are both related to habits that are not in our best interest. Uh, you know, me included, no judgment. I get it, you know. So to, to eliminate these sorts of things quickly is tremendously helpful. So if you can go and quickly stop someone from doing that and absolutely they're ready for it, I say do it. The quick approach 
is ideal because it gets people back out there living as quickly as they can. But it isn't always the exact answer for every single human being. I want to res- totally wipe out the, the client shame that I see that's in my office. You know, we, we go this way. I believe in it. I know it works. Let's do it for you. If it does not work, and you can't really insert that question in the hypnotic process because you never want to give that if. This is the trick of it, right? But yeah. if it does not work, guess what? Millions of other tools that are available for you for your success. And I think that that idea, it keeps people on the track of, I can succeed. And there are tools that match me. And that, to me, is actually more of a winning uh, a, a disposition than to say, oh, that's the only tool that was available. It didn't work for me. I'm a lost cause. And that's the people that I see. You know, they come in and they say, well, I did hypnosis. I see you did hypnosis, but it was it didn't work. So therefore, I must be a lost cause. No, 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 no. I mean, you even, you know, I, I don't know you, Jonathan, but I imagine that in your creativity and in your sensitivity to people, that even though you might have your protocols that you come up with creative interventions that you sense is going to work for that person better than that. Suggestions that are going to work better for that person there because you're probably always trying to figure out what is the exact piece of puzzle in their piece of puzzle in their overall puzzle. You know, you're looking for that which fits them. And in the process of fitting them, that's that's much more powerful for them and for the hypnotic process. I can just go on. I'm sorry, Jonathan. What are you thinking? No, okay. no it's brilliant, Carol. It's brilliant. And, and the reason I'm not butting in more often is because it's gold. What? It, so, you know, that's why I'm just kind of, well, carry on type thing. Uh, yeah, no, you're right. I do sometimes uh, because if someone just jumps into my head, whether you call it instinct, experience, or well, an element of both and observation, you, sometimes you get the cue from body language, don't you? Or you the hesitancy yeah. in their voice. As they say something, but something in your head goes, ah, maybe we need to cover this as well. And we'll just make up a suggestion on the spot or add something in. Yeah. Um, Exactly. As you said, everyone is different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay. I was looking at me. Oh, by the way, smoking, your smoking protocol. I'm assuming you uh, talk about that in your books Kiss Smoking Goodbye and Quit Smoking. Kiss away cigarettes. Yes, my method of KISS, the kiss kiss away method of stop smoking. It it looks at the issues of smoking from eight or eight eight different um, perspectives. So it tries to get this this holistic picture of the human being that's in front of me. So whether it, you know, so it's looking at the social cues, it's looking at the habituation, it's looking at the the physiological impact of nicotine and the toxins related to that, and how that's just purely addictive on that level. It goes to this the psychosocial frame in terms of the people that smoke around them or the stressors in their life. It goes to the identity and the way they might have organized their personality around cigarettes being cool or being cigarettes being social or cigarettes being accepting or cigarettes, you know, de- deactivating anxiety. So, you know, because you're feeling a little bit of social anxiety. So it looks at all at like eight different dimensions and it tries to really understand the human being as much possible as much as possible in the process of it, of the multidimensional aspect of who they are. And then it, it, it creates, um, I have different interventions. I do video with them and then I do music and I do uh, hands-on hypnosis for a period of time. And then I have them go out and do certain activities in the community and come back. And it's all in the course of the same exact day so that they actually go to the path. Like, you know, like the people have the path. You know, there's smoking path where they get the yeah. smokes, where they do you know, like that. And, you know, often we try to get them to do another path. Well, I actually have them go on that path and deactivate it and then come back to the office and deactivate it. So so I integrate all of these things that I possibly can oh. in the course of my one day with them. And then it, it, I also find that it's really important for them to know that you coming back in 30 days and you're staying in touch with me each of the days between now and the 30 days. And the reason is that is that you, the, one of the hypnotic suggestions are you are not on your own. You are not left on your own. I'm right here with you because there are some people that need to know you're there. I mean, the AA programs, the 12 step programs are all about day at a time and we're here for you. And so on that same integrative process, I take that and include that in the process as well, because they need to know I'm there for them. And that way, they're not going to feel like, oh, I felt I'm left on my own. 
this didn't work for me. I'm out of the picture. No, 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 no. We are here to succeed. What's it going to take for you to succeed? Doesn't matter because we are here to succeed. And that, that fundamental commitment means we're going to do everything. You're going to do everything to succeed. And that's, and, and that, and we don't let up until you succeed. That, that's, now, part I, of this, that's part of the suggestions. Yes, sir. I agree with you entirely, though, except for, well, I just want to clarify one bit, because you, you mentioned AA and the 12-step uh, plans, as it were. Yeah. Now, the way you've explained that you, you offering somebody support, I believe, is incredibly important, yes. For some. But not the way that the AA do it. My belief is that the AA, the first thing that they do at meetings, hi, my name's Jonathan and uh, I'm uh, a recovering alcoholic. Mm -hmm. Hang on a minute. No, 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 no. If you've not been drinking for days, weeks, months, even years, but even if it's only months, you are teetotal. You are not a recovering alcoholic. That is a negative suggestion because you're implying you're setting yourself up for relapse, would be okay. my argument. Uh, well, and Jonathan, I would agree with you for 33% of the population. Here's the trick on this one. If you look at the statistics, AA is good for 33% of the people. 33% of the people that go to AA recover and they never go back. Or if they do go back, they come back quickly clean. So it, for 30, But there are 66% of the people out there that can't use AA in the pure AA form. They might be able to use part of it. They might be able to. There mm -hmm. are about 33% of the people who come to uh, a hypnotherapist who can stop drinking using hypnosis. You know, and so the statistics, so that's a statistical. See, there's that science empirical side of me that just kind of slips in is, you know, let's let's allow human beings to be diverse. And since we're a shrewd group of healthcare, mental health care professionals, we can meet the diversity heads on without intimidation. We don't need to fit any client into our modality. We don't need to fit any modality into a, a, a one, <laughs> one thing fits all. You, you have a thought. What do you want to say? I agree with you there, but plain devil's advocate here. I love it. There is nothing that any therapist of any description, whether hypnotherapy, CBT, psychotherapy, whatever, there is nothing, don't matter what the label is, there is nothing that as a therapist we are, empower people or help people to do that it is not possible for the person to do themselves. Now, they may not believe, and therefore, due to their lack of belief in themselves or lack of self-esteem, self-worth, whatever may be correct for that particular individual, maybe the block that stops them from doing it for themselves. But ultimately, you said, oh, 33%, it might work, 33% eh? it works for hypnotherapy. Well, ultimately, I would argue if the client is truly, truly ready at breaking point, time for change, that it, it, it'll work on a far higher percentage than that because we're just an excuse giving them permission and a place to feel safe to do what they could have already done themselves. But if they did it themselves, then people would go, why didn't you do it sooner? <laughs> the, it's the, there's that shame again, right? There's that blame mm. and the shame. Yeah. Well, you know, again, I think that what you're saying makes sense, but I don't think it makes sense for absolutely everybody. Again, I'd have to say that what you're, what you're saying, of course, I would think that we could move every human being into recognizing they could live really effectively on their own, that we could empower every human being. And that would be our ultimate goal. We would like to work our way out of a job. When, when clients graduate, I just, I, I'm going to miss them. I'm going to cry because I just love them so much. But I'm also going to cry because they're graduating and they're living, you know, that, and that's that thrill is that they're going to walk out in their own power, right? It's a thrilling experience to watch someone walk into their own power. And I think that that's our ultimate goal. But not everybody comes to us, like you said, if they're really ready. Well, Just I to mean, clarify, that... I am talking about the kind of things jobbing hypnotherapists deal with, you, your low-level addictions, phobias, and all that kind of stuff. When we get to what I call the high-end stuff, which I, goes more into the counselling side of things, I'm not saying this applies because 
generally um, then you've got layers of different problems that have interweaved together that have all got to be unraveled before they can be dealt with. You know, and well and well said. And I guess that's what you're saying on when you say when someone's really ready. In, but all the movement that it took in their lives to shift into being really ready and then and then they discover you and you're ready they're ready the synergism of that moment's magical and everybody does the shift and but but you know what what happened how did they get to that point and i really believe that we as as mental health workers can move people into that point and then they're ready and uh, that we don't need to look at hypnosis as just meeting them at this moment. But we can also use hypnosis to help empower them and shift them and move them to that magic point. And that, that's the, that is you know, hypnosis along with a lot of other clinical skills. It can be used in this moment and can also be used to the process of work. And you're right. It's, it's lots of layers. I mean, that's one of the th- – when I mentioned this book – one of the, uh, and I won't name names because I absolutely love this human being, a most amazing human being, an incredible master hypnotherapist, but I can't mention his name because we're going to disagree and I'm not going to do that unless he's here with me. So oh, <laughs> the, okay. dis- the disagreement was is he could take someone who had been raped, molested all their life, uh, gone, you know, been robbed and, and hit mm-hmm. violently or any sort of form of, of trauma and in one session completely relieve them all of all of the impact of that trauma and they can move on with life. I've actually seen that that happens where an individual could be created, amnesia could be created for an individual about a rape and they'd live on their life, the rest of their life as if that didn't occur. However, well, I do. I go I'm ahead. going to agree with you because I can see where you're going with this straight away. Yes, yeah. I, I, I'm fully aware that you can quickly do it and the person thinks you, you're like Jesus Christ and wow, it's not bothering me now anymore, the fact that I was gang raped or some other horrific thing. Yes. Um, however, I do think in that particular context, we're getting into the round of... Um, it, it, it is going to manifest itself in some other form. Mm. Through a habit of forming or an addiction forming or an anxiety, panic attacks down the line, or something that seems disconnected because the base feelings of shame and self blame that victims quite often wrongfully direct towards themselves won't have been dealt with, will they, and removed? Right. Now, and again, I think, Jonathan, you could argue that sometimes we don't need to always deal with everything. Sometimes we just need to, like, in this moment, figure out how we're going to respond in this moment. But other times, I totally agree, we, there are times when we need to deal with the layers and layers of what went on in the past. People are really different. So some mm. people, they will respond to something like hypnosis or EMDR, uh, that, which is very trauma-based, movement of the eyes. And it, it's, a, it's a very interesting neurological process that goes on with EMDR. Some people will respond with three sessions of EMDR, and the impact of their trauma seems to appears to be erased because they're no longer having physiological reactions yeah. that they could conjure up. They could think about the car accident and they immediately could conjure up an entire physiological complication or their body would contort and hold the contortioner soldiers with PTSD. I mean, the, the research on the psychosomatic reactions of soldiers who have been traumatized by their experience uh, when they're uh, deployed is that their body would come into a complete uh, contortion or they would have tics or they would have uh, inabilities to speak. And then do it, taking them through hypnosis and, and the somatic expression of the trauma, we could actually see that they could return to their body uh, fully capable of having their body respond in a normal way, not necessarily processing all the details of, their, of the horrible bomb or the loss of their buddy or their having to kill someone that they thought was an innocent. You know, it's on and on these horrors that they have to face. Yeah. Those horrors are still there and they cannot be erased. But nonetheless, we can disint- we can dis- uh, disentangle, I was going to say disintegrate, we can disentangle uh, the impact of that and free up their body. And sometimes that happens quickly, sometimes it happens over time, sometimes it happens without going back to the original event. And sometimes you have to go back to the original event. And so again, I'm still going to advocate that every human being is different. And all these tools are amazingly available for them. 
What are you thinking? You have such thoughtful eyes. You're you're just like well. So I'm, I'm, I'm like listening it. intently because it's pure gold. What what, oh, what thank your, you. your answers? And then I keep glancing down because I've got my notes here. <laughs> Whoa. Little bullet points. You did come prepared. I that was so nice. Thank yeah, you. Only, only some bullet point triggered words. <laughs> um, and the one that just caught my eye then was because we talked a little bit about trauma there. Because obviously we can't. We you know we, our time is limited. So I wanted to then. Uh, I looked down here and what caught my eye was that you also. Uh, and the links will be below, by the way, to Carol's website where her books are available. So there's the trauma one we've covered. Uh, we've mentioned the smoking. Mm -hmm. uh, you've also got books on uh, weight loss. If you can't stop eating, maybe you're hungry. Yeah. Well, here it is. If you can't stop eating, maybe you're hungry. This is one of the, the first books I actually put my picture on there. So you see, it's all that self-advertisement. Again, this is a, this is a, you're going to find that people with COVID-19 and been stuck in the isolation, some people are going to eat and some people are not. Some people are going to go into a, a real not hungry mode and other people that's going to be their primary solace and everything in between. So some people are going to cook, but not eat. Some people are going to eat and not cook. <laughs> it's like, you know, food, food's an interesting thing, but one thing you have to realize is that your body is always, always, always sending you signals as to what it needs in order to regulate you, in order to support you, in order to honor that it's there to take really good care of you. And if it senses that you have too many chemicals that are related to anxiety, it's going to signal that you should be eating a lot of carbs, which is all about narking yourself into kind of a sleepy state, you know. So oh, yeah. if you're if you're suddenly finding in stress or eating all this like stress relaxing foods, the chips and the cookies and the sweets and the breads, guess what? Your body is beautifully trained to take that heavy carb load and slow you down and make you sluggish. And that's kind of like an anti-anxiety pill. So while I don't really recommend indulging into this while you're in the midst of uh, going through COVID-19, because you'll regret it on the other side of it. Yeah. You know, but at the same time, you do need to sit there and say, well, my body is giving me a signal of hunger. It makes me want to go do that thing. But what is maybe the more underlying message my body is giving me? And yet again, it's like trying to understand maybe we could take that Freudian sense of unconscious, subconscious, and, you know, conscious the body is always trying to desperately communicate to you and say, you need da-da-da. And it's trying to do it by way of communicating whatever cravings it can produce inside well, of you. People don't listen to the body's law, do they? Life's got in the way. I mean, it's like, you know, the, the feeling yes. of hunger. A lot of people confuse the feeling of needing a drink. And quite often, yes. I always recommend to clients, you know, if you suddenly feel hungry, before you have something to eat, have, have a drink of water and give it a minute or two. If you still feel hungry, then yes. But the chances are, a lot of the time, you'll suddenly find, until you've retrained your mind-body connection. Yes, exactly. And that's what this book is all about, is being able to Excellent. start listening. Yeah, being able to listen to your body when it's when it wants when it's craving sugar, it might actually be that you're you are now very dehydrated. But your body doesn't know any other way to get you to kind of stir the juices to other than to like trigger some sort of craving and you go right to the craving that you might have cultivated unconsciously or consciously, as opposed to a brand new uh, relationship with saying, oh, I, oh, my body's dehydrated. Oh, that's what this craving is. When people start losing weight, here's another example. When people start losing weight, they tend to shift into a time their body is burning fat. Their liver is able to process the fat. They're burning it. They're accessing it in their cells. But at the same exact time, your body's going, oh, wait a minute. Our equilibrium that we've had for a while says that we're now low on fat. So you need to go eat fat. And so this is really confusing because you're losing fat. And the way you'll know you're losing it is that your body's asking you to go eat fat because it's trying to hold to that, that state. Of, 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 yeah. It's trying to hold you into that state because holding you steady is a better health than keeping you unsteady and losing weight's an unsteady process. And so your body is going to give you this, the messages about holding you steady. And it's going to tell you to go eat fat. And people go, Oh, I just can't stop from eating fat. I know I shouldn't. Because your body is actually losing fat. 
So you have to like mentally know that process and reprogram what that, that message actually is. Gee, my body needs fat. Guess what? You did it. You just went into a little bit of fat burning. You know, that's, it has, a, has to be a totally different meaning to it. So all of that is part of this book as well. Sorry about Excellent. that. Yeah. Um, oh, oh my. Yeah. One of the titles that interested me, and I, I can understand where it's coming from because I read. I, obviously, I read the description, but I think it'd be worth mentioning to the viewers at home are aware of it. Is your book titled "Reuniting Soldiers with Families"? Oh, you know, and I I don't have a copy of that because I've sold out my copies of that. But yes, so "Reuniting Soldiers with Families" is all about helping everybody deal with the impact of being deployed and coming back. So it's those soldiers that are deployed, because that's a very different experience than soldiers that are just going to a military camp or the families are with their soldiers. But yeah, yeah. so the PTSD, I talk about the PTSD. I talk about hypnosis uh, as well. You know, self-hypnosis, the process of being able to work through that to some degree. But just a tremendous amount of respect for the soldier and what they're going through, but also a tremendous amount of respect for the family, because that family has essentially been destroyed by whatever the soldier went through. There's just no way that the, the damage on the battlefield is completely parallel to the damage in the family. And we just have to really respect every human being that's in the matrix of that healing process. And that book tries to address those aspects of life. So actually, this naturally segues into the fact that you do do family therapy. Right. Um, and I'm having a mental brain fart right this second, but my gut <laughs> says I want to say the name, and I might have this wrong, but I think it's Virginia Satire. Yes, right. Miss yeah. Therapy, did she? Yeah. yeah. I seem to recall. Um, now, from what I've read and stuff, because family therapy is not something that I've done, and I'll be honest, it's not something I would ever have a desire to do anywhere. Oh. <laughs> um because um, I, I know my talent is isolating a person and getting them to change their thought Beautiful. system or whatnot. Whereas Beautiful. with family thing, you've got a dynamic. You've got to, you've got to work with the whole family, haven't you? Um, do you do that together as a group, or is it individually, or is it a combination of all that? What how, how's it kind of work? It's all of that, depending on what the session's going to have. I have a very large office when I'm in my office, right? We're not in my office right now. Uh, it can't be. But I have a very large, <laughs> very large office. It's a little bit like a family room. It even has a family room couch. It even has a place for your cups and your popcorn. And let's turn on the movie. In other words, I make it, <laughs> I make it a very family-friendly environment. And so people can have their own space on the couch and have their own voice in the family but sometimes I do find that it's better to change the configurations of the people that meet. Um, sometimes it's better to have the one-on-one -on -one, or it's better to have just one person or it's better to have three out of the five or all five. And so I try to I play with the matrix of it um, so that it, so we can make the progress that we need to in order to move things ahead. But I do find family therapy is incredibly complex. As you know, living in a family is complex. Well, yeah. <laughs> Which is another good reason why I won't want to get into it. Just seeing, you know. um, yeah. do, do, you, do any of your books go into that whole kind of dynamic stuff? I suppose it must a little bit with the reuniting soldiers with families. Um, I, I, I do. I, I do it in uh, different ways. So like the, the book that I have on evolving women's consciousness, that will mm -hmm. go in terms of the role of the woman, uh, both as daughter, mother, grand parent, grandparent, grandparent, and th the role that she has in the family. Uh, so I go into a little bit in that regard. I definitely do that in terms of the role, uh, the impact of abuse and trauma within a family when a whole family has been uh, traumatized or when the family, one of the family members is actually the abuser which uh, I, I do want to just say for a moment, Jonathan, I don't know what's happening in the UK, but in the United States, when we get clear statistics, aha, there's the rub, the uh, rise of domestic violence has gone way up with the social isolation. People are living together in incompatible yeah. family situations under tremendous stress. Where's the job? Where's the money? Where's the food? Who, who could be sick? And they're already incompatible in terms of so many things that, you know, predate them suddenly being stuffed into the same arena. And amplified, yeah. You know, so, it, so I do really have a heart for the domestic violence aspect of what's going on. And I've reached out to 
to to people I'm reaching out to you right now and saying, please, please, please get your family, get yourself on an online therapist. I do online. You're doing online work in, so that you don't necessarily make life worse than it already has to be with COVID-19 and isolating. It's just too easy to take horrible things out on the people that most rely on you to love them and accept them and not judge them. I mean, it's just so easy. I don't know why we are nicer to our neighbors and strangers than we are to our own family members, but it's a, it's, it, it's, it's a complex, it's a complexity that does occur. So I, I just wanted to segue, hold that in there because that's very relevant to the COVID-19 process that people, some people are suffering. Um, What's the next keyword that pops out at you there, Jonathan? Um, that's exactly what I was looking at. <laughs> but you know what? I should really just draw lines through the thing. You know, covered. You've just mentioned. <laughs> you've just mentioned evolving women's consciousness. Done eating, smoking. <laughs> oh, here we go. Another one of your books: spiritual gurus, spiritual paths. Oh, oh you're so in Phoenix as well. I was going to mention that. Yeah. This is more um, sort of new agey consciousness Absolutely. type books from what i could you know tell us a little bit about them yeah both of these are about the spiritual aspect of life and um this is about the magic and these are about the different uh schools of um religious thought and okay. so true to my form in life this takes 16 different religious perspectives or spiritual perspectives and analyzes them in terms of what their what their basic underlying principles are, what they're specifically dra- addressing about human nature. For example, a lot of uh, Buddhism is is addressing how to live in a peaceful, equi- equ- equanimous. Oh, how do I say that, Jonathan? The life of equanimity. <laughs> you know, the sense of that was it. Equanimity. There you go. <laughs> equanimity. And this book has a lot to do with that as well, is how to own your inner peace, how to really cultivate this instead of having the anxiety of life. And so um, Buddhism has has very specific principles and ideas that are all relevant to, um, you know, to a series of different ways of living a noble, truthful life of peacefulness and equanimity. I even said it better the second time. Yes. But then it also talks about Christianity and Judaism, and it talks about uh, spiritualism and mysticism. It talks about the love of money as a religious form of self-expression, um, and it talks about success formulas and how those are also religious forms of spiritual expression as well. And my idea is that at any given time, we are probably on a spiritual path in one respect or another. And you might want to just kind of take a look at what your spiritual path is in this current moment and evaluate what you've embraced to optimize that spiritual expression of yourself. So I think that, for example, we're in an era of helplessness. We're feeling helpless around our politicians, at least in the United States. Yes, I did get political. <laughs> there as well, to be honest. Yeah. Oof. You know, and, and we as citizens feel helpless about the impact that other people's decisions are having on us. Now we have a disease that has this on us. We have worries about money. We feel like the financial economic system is not in our control. We're feeling a lot of like, we're not in control who is. And those people who are in control are like, what? You know, it's like, there's nonsense going on. And so that experience of not being in control is actually an issue of our error. And it becomes a, it becomes the challenge to address that issue in a spiritual way, for example. So to be metaphysically uh, oriented would be my Your Soaring Phoenix. Okay. Okay. And Your Soaring Phoenix has a way of taking 42 different spiritual experiences, mystical, reverential experiences that are cultivated in tools. So tools of remote viewing, tools of astral projection, tools of um, psychic reading, tools of mediumship, tools of, I consider these tools. So there's 42 of these different tools that are referenced in this book. I have it upside down. That was helpful. You You did before, Lord. (laughs) So these 42 tools really demonstrate to people the power we have as mystics, the power we have as embedded shamans in our society, to not reside in our powerlessness. Like we said before, we're always going to have some edge of 
being part of a collective and that collective having impact on us. But to the degree that we can actually rise up to our own, our own power, whatever that is, and occupy ourselves with the loving, benevolent, and powerful expression of our power, we're more busy being that than we are at being the victim. We're more busy engaging in that hypnotic suggestion of what we can do than what we can't do. And um, that, so on a, on a metaphysical level, that's what this book is all about, is so that people can really realize, and I think hypnosis is one of the best tools in the world of mental health to help people realize the power that they have. So for example, what you said earlier was just priceless when you say that person, if they could just recognize that they could do all of this on their own, if they could just recognize it, that they didn't need us, that this was kind of more of a crutch than necessary, you're essentially saying, I want them to understand their power. That it's like amazing. Yeah. When you see someone in your one, two, three, whatever sessions, and you see them shift, I mean, both you and that person have this sudden surge of amazing. This is like a miracle. And yet it wasn't a miracle. It was the enactment of our power. And so that ability of hypnosis to bring that, that spark alive and in that instantaneous moment is just one of many ways that we as human being, beings begin to go, if, if that's a moment of power, what else is out there that I haven't even yet explored? And there are some conspiracy theorists that say that at once upon a time, maybe Constantinople, et cetera, the papacy of the Catholic Church wanted to disempower its followers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. As, long, as long as the government has us disempowered, we are at its bidding and we're at its mercy. Easier, easier to control, more malleable. Well, that media, I mean, it's not a conspiracy theory. It's sadly a fact that the media, mass media in general, or as Trump would call them, the lamestream media. Oh. Um, <laughs> well, on that one thing, I've got to kind of agree with him. Um, it's full of either fake news, manufactured bullshit, excuse the language, or sensationalised. And that's why in the, in the media industry... Uh, I know some journalists, and they say that oh. there's a saying, if it bleeds, it leads, which means if it's an atrocity, death, blood, guts, gore, fear, uh, tragedy of some form, yep. that it's going to make the front page. And it sells papers, even though people will sit there and end up conditioning themselves to feel scared. And I think we're seeing that with covid um, with the, the sensationalised media that they're telling us, putting the emphasis on how many people are getting it, how many people are dying, and then hidden somewhere, paragraphs down, it will have the good news that that's actually quite a small percentage because the majority of people are recovering. Well, wouldn't it be more beneficial to people to know that the majority of people are recovering so that they can feel a sense of optimism, which is going to help potentially increase their immune system rather than being scared confused but in that anxious fear state that arguably can reduce the immune system I just... well let me ask you this because this is a dilemma that i that i, I, I i've been thinking about this too here's the dilemma that i see mm. is that we do know that so, so, social isolation or physical isolation does reduce the likelihood of it spreading so, you know, yes. you've, probably, you've probably seen that thing where you have a series of matches and then you have one match move out mm -hmm. and, then, and then the fire doesn't continue. And that really is we want to remove ourselves so that we are not part of the chain reaction of the firing continuing. So to remove ourselves, to be motivated to remove ourselves, we need to be, you know, sufficiently, um, in, sufficiently manipulated into saying that removal is about ourself survival or the survival mm. of someone we love and i call that manipulation and i think that's probably a wrong word but nonetheless i'll stick to it for now uh we need to be sufficiently manipulated into realizing we have to keep ourselves out of the of the process of the chain reaction well how do we motivate people to do that when we're saying oh don't worry most of you will survive no big deal you know how do we how do we do both how do we both empower people and get them out of the way 
Yeah, well, that is an oxymoron in fairness because of the other element. You isolate people and that, well, it's already showing that unfortunately, certainly in England, uh, we've already had cases of people who, who, who've committed suicide. Oh, gosh. Um, and it's been reported that it just because they just couldn't handle the entire, suddenly they're not able to work. And at the time, they didn't think they were going to have any money. The government stepped in now, but too late, and providing financial support to people. So it, 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 for a lot of people, I think it's having a drastic effect on the mental health. I totally agree. So the, the whole idea of how, how to say this social isolation is about you loving yourself and loving someone else is, is a very different, I call it a physical isolation. It's about loving yourself and loving someone else. It's not about depriving yourself. You know, it, it, it's it's about a gift of love. It's a gift of that um, uh, kind of monastic sense of let's go into our inner space and let's let's give let's give breathing room for those people who uh, otherwise, uh, if we breathe on them, we could kill them if we're carriers, or we could be killed if they breathe on us. So you know, it's like it's it's like on some level, if we could look at it more of an act of love and an act of love for ourselves, an act of love for others. What a different consciousness that would be than out of an act of fear, out of terror, you must stay home. Yeah. And, that, and that act of love. So what do I do in this act of love in my home? How do, I, how do I steer this moment into that mysterium of beauty and that mysterium of gift to self and others? And so this morning I was actually listening to someone talking about that. And if you go into the deep state of meditation, which is a deep hypnagogic state, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, hypnotherapists and When they look at mindfulness and meditation, we all kind of go, yeah, guys, glad you're using a different word, but it's hypnosis. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Right? Right? Been there. We know that. But if you're more comfortable with that word, we'll go along with that. Right? (laughs) You know, I remember when I couldn't use that I do hypnosis with people and I had to use the term I do guided imagery because in my field, guided imagery was acceptable and it had empirical data to it. But hypnosis at the time was still under suspicion. Oh, and it's the same bloody thing, exactly. really. Yeah. Exactly. yeah, exactly. And that's the same with mindfulness and meditation. But to get to go back on that same train, if your people can go into that deep, beautiful state of hypnagogic meditation, and they allow the stillness and the beauty of their souls and connection and the rest and the peacefulness and whatever imagery you want to create of health and well-being, you know, go for it, you know, create it. Be the creator in that state of imagination, that state of hypnagogic place. And we know that that causes a biochemical change to change yeah. to enhance your immune system. <laughs> you know, there we go. So that is as much relevant to surviving COVID-19 as it is the physical isolation. So if we could say this physical isolation is about you being able to move into that space, wouldn't that be a much better reframe, right? If you're talking about reframing. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's also the uh, not well as well as that, not instead of as well as in right. addition, <laughs> a, a classic element of reframing. Rather than now that people know there is an element of financial support being offered, so all it's right, it's not the full amount, but that slightly minimises it a bit. Rather than concentrating, focusing on what. They've lost the reduced income, the reduced this, and or being stuck in the house. Find something that you enjoy doing, um, what you enjoy reading, listening to, creating, drawing, track. Do something creative. Use it. Learn something you've always wanted to learn but didn't have the time. Find a positive use of the time so it empowers you in that manner as, as well. Yeah. And look, that's what you're doing. You're bringing all of us hypno hypnotherapy lovers together. Yeah, that, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. But you're doing it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I did start before the COVID thing was mentioned, but it has to be said that of the 53, this will be episode 54, when okay. it goes live in the morning, of those 54, it does have to be said that a good 30-odd of them have been done in the past three or four weeks. Yeah. So... Yeah, making use of the time. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Exactly. I think it's brilliant. And I i don't think you would have probably reached out to me if we hadn't been in the state. I don't think I would have been able to make the time. I'd be too busy in my office. And, 
you know, I, I find that it's really nice. I'm, I'm saving like eight hours of travel to and back from my office and I can spend that time doing a million of other things, you know? So, you know, it's, I do find, uh, Jonathan, I don't know what your verve is. I do know what some of mine are. I really don't enjoy that I'm on, I'm on the sidelines on this one. I mean, I'm trying to be on the four lines with my clients. I'm trying to reach out to people and say, you need assistance. Are you a parent of a, se- are you a, a child of a senior? Are you a parent of a child that's, that's highly anxious? Are you in a domestic situation that's really complicated by the situation? Please reach out. Online therapy has proven to be incredibly powerful. I had not made as much use of it as I have over the last two weeks, and I'm finding it to be incredibly powerful. Seeing you face-to-face, for example, I'm in your space. You're not yeah. in my space. You're at ease there. I'm at ease here. Yeah. And then and then I'm really actually closer to you now than I would be in my office where we're like at least six to well, nine yeah, feet away. Because <laughs> this floor sitting in an office will be weird. But it yeah. isn't weird in this context. Yes. Yeah. I'm still able to read your body language to the most degree. In fact, I can actually read people's pupil dilations better now because I do a lot of reading of the micro that, expression. Yeah. <laughs> right. So I actually am finding this to be incredibly powerful. Therefore, everybody, please find someone, online therapy, to assist you if you're having any complications. Don't hesitate. Don't don't yield to a sense of self-shame. Don't yield to a sense of I should be able to do this on my own. if you're in America, Carol's website's below. If you're not in America but you're prepared to schedule an appointment online at a time of day when – you can be up at the same time as Carol, then again, you can still go to Carol's link below. I will do it under whatever license I have to do it under because I have so many different licenses and certifications, you know, because I have to worry about all those legalities, at least in the United States. So, but I mean, th- 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 we have these modalities that really, really help people. Where were we going with this ahead of time? Because you had said something so brilliant and now well yeah look at your sheet of paper for that cue where i've lost track <laughs> yeah um no actually no yeah i don't think we have lost track because we we're, the last thing i mentioned was spiritual gurus spiritual paths and then you, you you told me about the other books and we're just segwayed into we're just free flowing the way i said it would be it's, yeah, it's all I, good. oh i remember where it was though and thank you for taking that segue time Everybody is going to be different in terms of how they're going to go through this. I personally yes. don't like being on the sidelines. I don't like being uh, not in the middle of the front line. I'd much rather be helping and being in the hospital and helping the patients and holding their hand and walking them through it and giving them whatever I can as a psychologist. I would much rather be a, a psychotherapist in the presence of the health workers that are also having a lot of mental stress and anxiety because this is like terrifying. Mm. They're bringing this home to their kids and their families. I, Last night, there was a, a doctor that was saying, you know, I wrote my will because it's possible that my kids will lose me. And she's a doctor. She says, but I'm committed to being a doctor in the front lines helping out. And so these people are all facing tremendous anxiety. And I want to be there right in the front line helping them. But my lungs are so severely compromised that I, am, I would probably be one of that 20% that's having to be incubated. So I've had to sit there and say, I am not among the noble. I'm not among the givers of grace. I'm not among the the healers in the front line on this one. I'm in the back seat. And this drives me crazy. (laughs) So when you say, when you say, uh, I'm using this as an illustration. When you say, find something you like to do. I'm trying to illustrate. That's what I would prefer doing. Right. You know what I'm saying? And so I want people to know that sometimes being stuck in your home is not your MO. It isn't your style. It is completely opposite of your personality, and as in my case. But nonetheless, finding a you that can exist in compatibility with your current situation is, is not something new to human nature. Uh, I mean, look at Britain had the lion's share of World War II bombings, and you have history of that. I only know it from watching all those wonderful history shows I see on England, because that's my origin. I love England. But, you know, but I've, I've never lived through that. And yet you all do have that ancestral experience of what it meant like to hunker down, survive, move on, face the horrors, be in situations that you couldn't stand to be in, and nonetheless find humanity and kindness and assistance and something of that sort that would work for you. And whether it was staying at home and praying or whether it was staying home and doing something you enjoyed 
uh, whether it's being helpful to people from a distance or up close. Again, everybody that's listening to this is unique. But be true to what's unique, but also be true to what your actual situation is, it is, so that you can optimize what you don't like about your situation, but you can find yourself being very fully present with yourself and your situation. So that's that's where I was going before I lost my train of thought. Okay, I've got time. We, you know, we've gone over the hour, <laughs> so I'm gonna have to uh, I'm gonna have to bring this to a close <laughs> in a minute and ask you, you a final question. Now, right. the final question I've got to now decide what that final question is going to be because I've only got one, and mm-hmm. I think it's going to have to be because we have touched on the family dynamic, okay. and along the way you've naturally touched upon relationship married relationships dynamics and and stuff in relation to um what's going on at the minute so that just leaves kids uh so my final question would be apart from the blindingly obvious because i know this said to some people on the mat going well that's a bit obvious what's the difference between working with kids to adults but I'm all, I'm talking both on a, a kind of counselling psychotherapy hat, but also hypnotherapy hat because with hypnotherapy, kids kind of already believe in imaginary friends and all that, so they're already they're already there without a formal trance induction, aren't they? But yeah, does that fact that they're already there without the need for a formal trance induction make your work in the more sort of serious family child therapy counseling side easier um well let me see if i understand your question you're saying does the fact that they're already suggestible in a hypno- hypnagogic sort of process, more than yeah, does, are, yeah. Does, it, does it make my work easier with them you know i think that i spent um i'm more naturally uh inclined to work with those individuals that are highly cognitive highly conversational that's my natural inclination okay so in light of that i had to spend a lot of years learning how to work with uh children that were not cognitively oriented but they communicated in a lot of different ways so i i spent a lot of time learning how to do play therapy symbolic therapy uh you know imagery art therapy expressive art therapy uh you know with a lot of discharge therapy so there's like a you know, how, how do I go play basketball with someone and get a conversation about their deeper, deeper situation? You know, how do I? So I found that with children, that as with adults, I have to use so much creativity and so much diversity in just helping them be able to, one, communicate what I need to understand about them. That can be hard enough. You know, they sharing with me what they've been told to not talk about or or they sharing with me with what they think is normal because it's all they've known, you know, they're getting raped by their uncle and that's all they've known. So they don't know. Do they have to talk about that? That would be an extreme example. Mm-hmm. So if, 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 if they don't know that it's, it's odd or it's, it's weird or it's harmful to them, they don't know to talk about. It. So, so the key is how do I help them talk to me about what they need to talk about? That's number one. And number two, how do I help them process it in a way that causes healing and evolution of their own self-empowerment to keep our theme of empowerment in there and children not having much power in their life really is a very different process because they have to, they're very dependent on their cosmos and the influence of their cosmos. So that would get to number three, the question of you said, is it easier to work with children? It's not from the standpoint that, that they are so much having to be reactive to what's moving into their world uh, and navigate that and negotiate that because they actually probably don't have much control or influence over that. So to help them have influence that they have, grow their personality in the secrecy of their own self-influence if the environment is not friendly with that. And then also to be able to affect a healing and a consciousness of what healthy processing would be like. I mean, I, so all these are very complex and I use a lot of different tools with children in that regard and to the degree that I can have impact on that outside world using Virginia Satir's models and a lot of other people's models then I definitely do try to do that but that can also be incredibly tricky as well so I think that one of the things that COVID-19 is having for children in the United States I'd love to know what it's like in the UK 
is that a lot of children feel like this is not very relevant to them and that it's time off from school and that therefore they should be allowed to play and be kind of, you know, left up to their own devices because parents still have to work from home or their parents are now. Yeah. You know, and, and, and they're not really using it to be productive and to groom themselves. I feel like most of the children that I work with are left to feeling like this is the time they should play because when they're home and they're not at school, it's playtime, right? You know, it's it's Easter vacation. It's uh, spring break. It's 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 like it's like not in their mindset to show up and be really engaged in the hard work of living, which their parents may be, um, because in our in our world here, we're, our children are very indulged into not living a hard life, and, I, and that's actually yeah. causing problems. <laughs> I'm, I'm very very lucky that my, my daughter does so many. Dance classes, drama classes, musical theatre classes, so many beautiful other classes, you name it, literally every day of the week. Um, and, she, you know, she excels at school. That She nice. naturally is asking to... She's actually doing, of her own accord, more schoolwork... Wow. Well, she's at home than she would have done had she been at school because they've given us work online and stuff to do. My wife dealing with all that because um, she's a lot more academic than me. <laughs> and um, yeah, she's got through like nearly in the space of two weeks, she's got through four weeks' work in two weeks. Bravo, bravo, bravo. So, so we're, I mean, we're very lucky, but yeah, I definitely observed it. Um, with friends on social media and stuff that it's like mm, exactly what you said basically well I'm so glad to hear that's such a beautiful model for the world and and teenagers and children have to wake up to you know this part of your life is about evolving yourself this part of your life is not about the time when you need you you need to detox or de-stress this time is about evolving how do you teach that to a child uh, who has pretty much left the whole educational to their teacher and to the homework assignments and to the the tutors. They're, they don't really think that they have to show up to educate themselves. It's like it's left to someone else to do it to them or for them. So it's a, it's a very different consciousness. I think we have to wake up to realize we've raised our kids to not be uh, taking as charge of their life as they need to. And bravo you, my kids too. Bravo you, your kids. They are living life with a full sense of engagement, but mine are grown and old because I mean, I'm almost as old as Sigmund Freud. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, you, well, you look, you, you, you're looking good for it, Carol. Oh, all right. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you for what has been, we've gone right over the hour. What has been best part of an hour and a quarter of pure gold. Thank as you. I say to people, get a pad, get a pen, watch again and take notes because there's more insights in how to improve your therapy sessions in the past hour and 15 minutes than you may have realized just as you've been watching along. But if you get a pad and pen and take notes, you should go along. Uh, it'll become clearer to you. Obviously, also look at the links below this video. The link will be there to Carol's YouTube channel, where she's got a whole bunch of wonderful informational videos that will explain a whole bunch of other things as well uh obviously there will be a link to her website where you can go and grab her books that we've talked about during the past hour thank you so much carol it's been an absolute pleasure it's been an absolute honor to be a part of your 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 tribe for this period of time and wonderful meeting you now you i too. know you more a little Hopefully more it will before. not be the last time yay we'll meet again <laughs> Good. And this will go live tomorrow, the 2nd of April. Uh, so I will tag you on Facebook when it goes live tomorrow. Good. I'll spread the news. And I appreciate you so much for doing this. Take care of yourself. You Be too. Well. And we'll see you all on the next episode, viewers. Bye for now.